Disaster recovery takes time and hard work. One way to keep your recovery moving forward is to avoid common mistakes and misconceptions. A common misconception is that the public assistance program is an entitlement program. Communities may think there's a set amount of funds for disaster recovery and that this money is automatically transferred to the local level or that if they had disaster related costs, they are automatically eligible. Take a look at this attitude that so many people have that uh, the federal government or the state government have agencies that come in with a big bag of money and just throw it willy-nilly out to everybody that needs it. That's not the way it works. The public assistance program is a grant program. The applicant must follow a process to ensure proper reimbursement for disaster related responses and recovery expenses. In most cases, the state and local governments are responsible for paying up to 25% of any eligible cost. The bottom line is, this is these are our tax dollars at work, whether they be local ad valorem, uh, state taxes or federal income tax, it's all, you know, it's all coming back you know, to those communities that are impacted by any type of disaster. Managing expectations is one of the biggest challenges a local leader is going to face after a disaster, whether it's a hurricane, a major flood, a tornado, or any other disaster. We have a kind of a saying in our neck of the woods, you know, the internet went down, but not people's expectation. It requires getting out there and taking some, taking some heat and and, and giving people the, the straight up, you know, this is where we're at, this is what we plan to do, this is how long we think it's going to get there. And if people don't like it, they'll vent, but at least they'll, they'll appreciate in the long run, okay, these people are, are telling me the straight up stuff, and okay, I, I don't like it, but I'll accept it. And managing expectations is probably the, the biggest challenge, and it takes, it takes a, a, someone and a group of people that uh, know how to deal with people, Deal, deal, know how to deal with people under stress, and, and, and don't, don't mind taking things personally. This recovery takes a very long time, and I've pegged it at three to five years for the initial recovery, 10 years before you won't be able to find any scars at all. And I think that's realistic. I think it makes a difference to communicate that, that recovery to the community, to give them some sense that it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, but that you make constant progress. Record keeping is critical in the public assistance process. Improper documentation could result in grant monies being delayed, returned to FEMA, or denied. Documentation is one of the most important parts of this program, and knowing what to do and having people there knowing how to document it properly just makes it so much easier, and that's how you get reimbursed quickly. Working um, beforehand and preparing staff to understand what they needed to do and what my staff needed to do and just what the field crews needed to be doing in the way of um, documentation and being able to provide that to us allowed us to hit the ground running as soon as we had our applicant briefing we were we, even before then we were off and running and gathering that information it's incumbent on the community to provide the documentation because you know we're, we're being reimbursed for expenses and it would be the same as is the way we would expect anybody that was a contractor of ours to do. So you have to have your systems in place. And we, we were fortunate enough to be experienced with pr prior events. We knew what was expected of us. We set up the systems and, and we provided that documentation. For the disaster assistance process to run smoothly and for reimbursements to be paid, applicants are required to document the following information. Who did the work? Who has the legal responsibility for the work? What work was performed? When was the work done? Where it was done? Why it was done? How it was done? And how much it cost? If possible, use photos to support the documentation of this information. Develop a financial and record keeping system to track this information. Make sure you have the right people doing the job. Your ability to track and manage your expenses will become very important because those eligible costs can provide substantial financial reimbursement to the community, but only if you've tracked your cost and kept them separate from those costs which would not be eligible. Let's review what is eligible under the PA program. First, only work submitted by an eligible applicant. Second, the work must be your legal responsibility, which is particularly relevant in emergency work reimbursements. And third, Facilities must have been in use when the disaster hit and sustained disaster-related damage not covered by another federal agency or by insurance.
The cost must be reasonable and necessary to accomplish the eligible work. It must comply with federal, state, and local laws and regulations and include deductions of insurance proceeds, salvage value, and purchase discounts. Contracts for work must be in compliance with state and federal procurement regulations and FEMA's guidelines. Generally, sole source contracts are not acceptable. Frustration occurs when participants in the process underestimate the necessary steps and the realistic timetables associated with them. The whole um, FEMA reimbursement process is not an expeditious process. It is a slow process. It is the documentation, the turning in of invoices and receipts, and then waiting for it to go through the proper channels before a check is actually returned to the locals. Project worksheets are not the last stop in disaster funding. They're only a part of the process. You've got to identify the damages, you've got to record your damages, you have to mark what's eligible, you have to write a project worksheet, and then you're about halfway there. No matter what the event, most disasters leave a mountain of debris. The issue that we've had most trouble with is debris management, and that's been an ongoing problem uh, since day one. Um, so we're still trying to come to grips with that. Uh, we need a better plan and that's what we're trying to work with. Whether it's a major hurricane, flood, or terrorist attack, large disasters require extensive debris removal. Debris removal projects require state and local officials to carefully manage contracts, work performance, and expenditures. Failure to keep good records or to monitor work performance can result in expenditures being denied or monies being returned when audited. Debris, whether it's from a fire or from a hurricane event or an earthquake seems to cause tremendous challenges for communities. Debris removal from public property is an eligible expense in the public assistance program. In rare cases, debris removal from private property may be eligible, but to qualify, the work must be the legal responsibility of an eligible applicant and be necessary to eliminate an immediate threat to lives, public health, and safety. Eliminate immediate threats of significant damage to improved public or private property. Or ensure the economic recovery of the affected community to the benefit of the community at large. If an applicant would like FEMA to fund private property debris removal, an applicant's going to need to make sure they follow their own ordinances and their own laws in order for FEMA to provide assistance to them. Applicants have to make sure that they follow all their local laws before they seek assistance from FEMA. The best advice? Check with FEMA first. Another factor in managing debris removal is your level of preparedness and the strength of your contracts. Never focus on one disaster with these contracts. Never think, for my, in my situation, hurricanes. Never think that hurricanes is the only disaster that you potentially could have. Your plans for debris and along with all these pre-contracts have to be an all hazards type plan. Make sure that if you're contracting with a debris company and all they do is pick up trees and garbage, when you need chemicals picked up and you need decontamination done, they also have to be an all hazards company along with uh, your, your plans as far as planning for that actual debris or the cleanup that occurs after any disaster. FEMA public assistance funds can only be used to restore operational public facilities to pre-disaster condition in accordance with local codes. This policy is sometimes misinterpreted by local governments. FEMA funds cannot be used to repair pre-existing damage to facilities or repair facilities that were not in use when the disaster struck. In addition, FEMA funds cannot be used for improvements to a damaged facility unless they are to help mitigate against a future disaster, in which case an applicant could seek grant monies through FEMA's 406 mitigation program. When cost-effective, during the disaster repair phase, FEMA may provide additional hazard mitigation funding to reduce the threat of future damage to the facility being repaired. FEMA encourages hazard mitigation because every dollar spent on mitigation can help limit future losses. One of the things that is helping in that area is uh, the mitigation um, planning that is taking place in communities so that a community can have 
pre-identified their uh, vulnerabilities or risks and, um, and opportunities to mitigate so that when the funding becomes available, they can utilize it. For those less familiar with the Stafford Act, there is often confusion between the mitigation programs outlined in Section 404 and Section 406. The primary difference between 406 and 404 is that the Public Assistance 406 program is to repair public infrastructure. So a bridge or, um, or a building, a public building, needs to be damaged in order to qualify for 406 funding. The regular public assistance program will not cover improvements, so don't miss opportunities under 406 mitigation. Section 406 mitigation allows you to only improve or strengthen the portions of the building or infrastructure damaged from the disaster. Section 406 mitigation is an important tool, but you have to understand its application and use in order to maximize its effectiveness. Section 404 mitigation is covered in more detail in the mitigation segment of this video. FEMA, working with the state, has the responsibility to assist local governments in identifying effective mitigation measures for public facilities. But no one knows your community and its unique risks better than you.